Hello church, welcome to the Growth Devotional today. This week we're going to be going through 1 Timothy 2 and 3. Next week obviously we'll be on 1 Timothy 4. So I have the privilege of sharing these with you again. I love doing these devotionals with you. We have many different teachers in the church. Uh, I've been able to do quite a few of these. I hope that you're enjoying it. So 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to be pretty concise today. I'm just going to pick out a few of the specific points that I'd like to talk about and for you to be able to be blessed by today. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, let's once again just begin in 1 Timothy 1. We're going to invite the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Jesus, Holy Spirit, for teaching us your word. This is your book. We submit to you. Highlight to us what you want us to hear. Amen. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 says, Timothy, my son, we always read, remember the first, uh, the last scriptures of the last chapter, going into the chapter before. It's a good habit. Remember, the Bible is not written in chapter and verses. So it's one long letter we want to read where it's going from. Timothy, my son, I give you these instructions to keep with you the prophecies once made about you so that you'll be following them. You may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are these people whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. So that's where we ended off. Now we're in, uh, going into verse one of chapter two. I urge then, first of all, that requests prayers and intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone. So he wants prayers, thanksgiving, and requests to God to be made for everyone. Then he specifically talks about specific people they have to be made for. For kings and all in authority. So you got to pray for everyone. Here's the deal. I know that some people might not like certain people that are in politics. You still got to pray for them. You still got to bless them. You might not, it might not be your favorite mayor or your favorite president or your favorite uh, police officer or whoever, but God says because their leadership put there by the Lord, we must honor them and pray for them. So, you know, according to God, he wants all people to have requests made for him. You see, uh, as Christians, we don't have a right to be gossiping about people. We can't speak bad about leadership. You know, this is in this chapter and, and other places in the Bible, it specifically talks about us honoring all authority and leadership. Now, I understand that some authority might be corrupt. Some leadership not, might not be what you think it should be, but God still says we must pray for them. We must be offering up requests for them. You don't have a decision. You can't do anything about where they're at in, a, in leadership, but you can do something about your reaction to them and if you're going to pray for them and obey this command. So I would really recommend when you send out blessings, never forget, you will get blessings back. When you send out curses, gossip, you will be gossiped about and you'll get curses back. So we have to make sure we guard our mouth. And even if we have feelings about certain people, we must always protect what God has said by interceding, praying for them and offering requests. Okay. All right. And it says that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. So if we pray for these people, God's going to help us to live in peace. Okay, you're not going to lose your peace over these people because when you pray for people, you release them from being able to harm you and bother you. That's powerful right there. When you pray for somebody, you're releasing them from being able to harm you because you're not able to get offended at people that you pray for. Think about that. You won't be able to get offended at people that you consistently pray for because if you dig in in prayer for them and intercede for them, God's going to give you his heart for that person, which will be a heart of love and wanting to see the best for their life. So you can't be hurt by them or offended by them anymore in the same way. This is a powerful way to release yourself from anybody around you who may be speaking bad about you or doing anything. Or pray for your enemies, Jesus says. Why does he want us to pray for our enemies? Praying for those who hurt us, giving gifts to those who try to steal from us so that their power will not be able to be effective on our lives. Wow. God wants to set you free and he does it through praying for them and loving them. This Praying for these people, it says in verse 3, is good and pleases God our Savior. It pleases God when you choose to pray and bless somebody in authority. Pray for them. Pray for their health. Pray that God would help them. Pray that God would give them wisdom. Pray that they would be not swayed by the enemy, but, but by God and that they'd surrender their lives to Him. When you do that, it says it pleases the Lord, who wants for all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the one truth, who is Jesus. Let's go down to verse 8. 
He says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. So he's talking about people. He's given us a quick thing in prayer here. And he says that when you pray, for your prayer to be effective, you want to have released all anger and all strife in your life. Strife between family, brothers, sisters. You don't want to go into prayer having that on you. You want to make sure you've released all that before you go into prayer. And especially any anger. He talks about when you lift up your hands in prayer, he says God is looking on the inside of you when you pray. He's listening to your words, but he's actually looking at your emotions. He's looking inside your thoughts. He sees inside of you. He wants you to be in a place where you're clear. No anger, no offense or disputes. Release those people release those situations so that when you pray, it's effective. It's powerful. He then goes on through the rest of chapter 2 and speaking about some contextual things that are in the Greek Roman era that was at that time, specifically speaking to women uh, with the way that they were doing their clothes and and hair pieces and all that. Now remember, from verse 9 all the way down through the end of the chapter, these are all contextual to the culture. So when he's specifically addressing women and men, he's speaking specifically to the culture of what was going on in the Greek and Roman time. Uh, We know that because braided hair, for instance, let me just give you an example. He says women should dress in decency, never with braided hair, gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Now we understand that that is not something that's universal. We would never preach for a woman not to braid her hair and come to church. You have to understand this is contextual. That also assumes with the other verses that are going on in that chapter, we won't get into it because there is a specific one, women learning in silence, not permitting them to teach and have authority. A lot of men want to just pull that out of the scripture, but they're not keeping it within the context of everything else that's being said. So there's a lot to say on that, but let's just continue on going. Let's go to chapter three, uh, 1 Timothy chapter three. This is great. And we're going to start in verse 2. Now the overseer, verse 2, he's talking about specific roles in the church now where Paul's starting to address people. And he said, the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife. Husband of one wife. Think about some of these things. Think about if we actually used our churches and our leadership to be through these same um, guidelines before we hired them. Temperate. He would have to be a person who's self-controlled. Wow. When is that ever checked about? Respectable, have an honorable reputation. Hospitable, hospitable. Some people I've met in church don't even like people and they're leaders. I knew a pastor. He said, I don't even like people. I don't want to be a pastor. I'm like, you don't like people and you want to be a pastor? (laughs) How long? And this man had been pastoring already. He's like, I don't want to be a pastor. He's like, yeah, I don't want to be one. I don't really like people. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> and able to teach. So everyone is able also to break down the Word of God and be able to teach it to people. Not given to drunkenness, not violent, gentle, not quarrelsome, meaning it's not a person who stirs up arguments or strife, not a lover of money, doesn't mean they don't have money, they're just not controlled by it, must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. So this is one of the verses that we do have. Um, from the Bible, and there's other ones as well, where it talks about specifically the man being in the role of the spiritual authority over his house, spiritual leader in his household. Now, here's what I want to clarify. Both parents are leading their household spiritually. I really want to say that. Both parents, husband and wife, both lead their household spiritually. However, the man is known as the head of authority when it comes to the spiritual atmosphere of his home. However, of course, the mother is inputting spiritually into her sons and daughters, is inputting spiritually into her husband. They're mutually, consistently building each other up, speaking the word to each other, praying for each other. It is a co-partnership. I do want to make that clear. But when it comes to the, uh, this, this specific authority agenda and the way that God has created this, he did create that the man or the husband would be a spiritual authority over the household. Okay, so once again, there's other scriptures and things about that as well. That in no way means that the woman should not be speaking the word uh, in the house, raising up the, all of her children, speaking with her husband, uh, helping her husband, ministering to him, praying over him. I mean, there's all kinds of things. There's definitely a partnership and we need each other. Okay, every married couple, praise God. He must manage in that they will obey and respect. Wow, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Oh. Wow. In other words, you know what God is saying right now? This is so powerful. 
from what God just said right there, and we'll, and we'll just say one more thing and then we'll end. God is saying, and this is what it's against a lot of churches. God is saying, if anyone, listen to this, cannot manage his own family and his own home, how will he take care of God's church? God is saying you got to put first things in their rightful place. Your job and what you do is not first priority over your family. Your family is your first ministry. God is saying you need to get things together and be able to have a, a, a powerful family. Raising and considering your home, your first ministry, your first church. Be in your home spiritually. Your wife giving to your husband, your husband giving to your wife. Spiritually raising up your kids in the way they should go so that the, when they're older, they would not depart from it. It's powerful that your home becomes your first ministry. He's saying, if you haven't set this right first, I already know you're not going to be able to handle what God wants to give you in this ministry. Your first ministry is your family. There's a lot we could say about that because that's controversial in the church, but the Bible is very clear on what he wants us to do when it comes to priorities. Uh, let's go right to the, uh, to the end. I love verse 14. One last thing. He says, if I'm delayed in knowing, this is the way I wanted you to teach people how to conduct themselves in God's house. Wow. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. The church of the living God is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Do you know that you're part of a pillar? You're part of a solid foundation by being a part of this church. You're part of a pillar and foundation of the truth. It is God's house. Think about that. It's not Pastor Marco's house first. It's not Gavin's house. It's not anybody else's house here first. We're all coming to God's house. He rules it. He's the ruler and authority over this house. He's the spiritual head over all of us. And as long as we acknowledge him as that, so this house will continue to prosper and your lives by being a part of this house will be blessed. God bless you. Have an incredible rest of your week. We'll see you for chapter four, just a little while. God bless.